going to walk through a talk which has got a slightly deliberate, uh, deliberately provocative title about ground truth. I could have put this in quotes, and the reason is that it's one of these terms I hear so many times. Um, it's like natural experiment. It's usually neither natural nor an experiment. Um, and ground truth, you could say, is uh, it's really suspect. We should be very suspect whenever we hear anyone talking about truth. Um, and I'm a very skeptical person when it comes to mentions of truth, and all the more so when it comes to things that relate to uh, machine learning and natural language processing. So I'm going to be talking through a, a very blatantly self-promotional sort of greatest hits of Ken Benoit um, uh, discussion about ground truth because I've dealt with this a lot in my various work and I want to issue some prescriptions and warnings for people who are, who are using this concept when it comes to, to text and uh, specifically human annotation. So this is me here. I'm at the London School of Economics, not too far away, and that's my web page and it's my Twitter handle if you're interested in any of these things. Right, so this curious notion of what is ground truth. Ground truth, as in maybe ground coffee. So uh, it transforms the seeds of a raw product into something more useful, uh, we could say, but it starts to lose its freshness as soon as it happens. Um, if you're one of these coffee geeks, you know, you'll, set, you'll get some super expensive grinder, and the moment that the coffee is ground, it starts to become stale, and uh, you know, it's imperfect, and no one would ever buy it in a bag. We don't need to get into that. I'll tell you another coffee joke, though, which is why does this coffee taste like mud? Because it was ground oh. only minutes ago, huh? It's a, it's a first speaker of the day. You've got to make some allowances, even if the humor is really bad. OK, so um, in meteorology, what does ground truth mean? So meteorology, you've got instruments, maybe satellites, or you've got some kind of weather sensing thing. And it's telling you, an instrument, about what the ground condition is of the weather. And if you live in a place with really variable weather, as I have, um, like Ireland, you know, you might have something, you might be watching television, tells you that there's a terrible rainstorm, and you go outside and it's not. Uh, ground truth is whoever is on the ground telling you that, you know, whatever uh, the conditions from the instruments are saying exist uh, can be verified by someone who's actually on the ground. So when you talk about ground, it's not a metaphor in this sense. It's actually someone who could be physically on the ground. Similar with military applications, you know, there's a difference between sensing that uh, a rocket has been fired from North Korea, well, okay, that's not a good example. There's a difference between sensing that something has happened militarily and actually the fact that it's, it really has happened. And in str strategy and tactics, the military, you know, commanders on the ground with binoculars will verify that something that appears to be happening is actually happening. So what does this mean when it comes to machine learning? Well, in machine learning, ground truth, refers to the accuracy of labels that we use for training supervised classifiers, typically. It refers to the same thing as what we use to assess the performance on some sort of training set. And it's uh, extremely common, of course, in every computer science paper that I've seen almost has got the mandatory sort of plots of, you know, the uh, ROC curves or the um, precision recall trade-offs. And you know, here is our method. It's go nicely across the top, and all the other methods are somewhere in the middle. Um, you've got tables of precision recall, measures of accuracy. The idea uh, is to compare which one is better. But compared to what? Well, compared to this notion of ground truth. In classical, in more classical settings, we used to call this a gold standard. So when you're talking about human annotation, uh, compared to you know, when you're trying to assess the reliability of coding. Uh, the ideal standard would be to compare it, you know, the highest level of testing would be to compare it to some sort of gold standard. Gold standard is another metaphor, right? Gold standard um, is something that's very difficult to even figure out. You know, gold has different levels of standards itself. It has different levels of purity. And there are different tests to figure out what's really gold or what's some sort of alloy of gold. If you want uh, an interesting uh, intellectual digression about, um, which I'm not going to fully provide here, but Look up what a definition of a meter is, or look up the, what the definition of a kilogram is. Kilogram is mass. It's not weight. It's supposed to be the constant the level of mass. And um, it used to be that there was this platinum meridian bar that the French kept in this special vault that was the special length of a meter, which would be perfect until some idiot drops it, right? And then it's no longer a meter. 
Um, and now, you know, it's defined as some sort of constant relative to the speed of light, which unless you're traveling through a black hole or something, I guess is constant. But they're constantly updating this idea that if you have a, a you know, an, an innate inviolable standard to compare things to, um, then uh, you've got a, you know, a gold standard. And in, in this case, it's not only a metaphor, and platinum is probably better than gold in this case. It's a platinum iridium standard. So what is the problem with this notion? Why, uh, why are we talking about potential problems? Well, ground is a metaphor, and this metaphor is often stretched too far. Truth, of course, is an assertion. In intellectual fields, we should know, if you've ever looked at the history of science or if you've been to your latest, uh, uh, I don't know, faculty meeting or uh, if you've ever submitted something for peer review, you'll know that a lot of this has to do with assertions and argumentation and sometimes personalities and sometimes positions of people who can deny you tenure involving these assertions. Truth is an assertion and um, it's also set by the accepted standards of a discipline. So um, one of my favorite uh, arguments in favor of doing something dumb is just to point out that everyone else is doing it. Um, you know, you might hear that when your kid comes home from school after getting in a fight while well, everyone else was doing it. That's exactly what we use as scholars when we want to defend something. It's called justification by citation. Well, we know it's not right, but it's been done and it's got a hundred citations and so-and-so did it, so it must be okay. There are very little to no reliability statistics ever reported when it comes to human annotation and the accuracy for labeled sets. In computer science, at least, and in most social science, we just take these as given and we accept a couple sentences or a footnote which says that the authors or their students or somebody you know, classified these things and we use some procedure. But there's very seldom even an appendix that tells you how reliable that process was. And that is one of the key problems when it comes to annotation and then calling it ground truth. So what are the consequences of this? The consequences are in our supervised methods, and this could include everything from simple regression, which you could think of, of you know, sort of unconditional estimates in a model, or some sort of supervised procedure, including classical regression models where these things are used on the left or right-hand side, or in machine learning models where we're trying to predict something based on a set of labels. We have unknown error rates. We have error rates that come from errors in human annotation. We have no idea what those are which means that we have an unknown benchmark for assessing the performance of these models in terms of our classic things like precision and recall or accuracy if we have a balanced uh, set. We don't know, and that's a problem. So where does ground truth come from? Let's back up, and I'm going to walk you through some examples now. And this is where I, I told you that I would shamelessly borrow from work that I've done. Hey, if you can't uh, promote your own work, you know, whose work can you promote? The answer would be yours. Uh, right. So human annotation is part of the research process. Where did this come from? One, some, one source of it is the authors themselves. So the authors will say, you know, our team of absolutely brilliant people came up with these codes and the labels, and that's what we use. Students are another one, graduate students especially. We get some graduate students to do it, um, or some other students, or we just get some generic students. And an increasingly popular one now is crowd workers. So we, get, we put it on Amazon, uh, Mechanical Turk, or we put it on Crowdflower, or we just come up with our own platform and we recruit some anonymous, faceless people who are willing to work for pennies and do it really quickly. Sometimes the ground truth accompanies the data. So we could also identify cases where this is part of the data generating process. The classic example when it comes to reviews and there's a lot of work done because of the obvious commercial benefits of reviews, but also the, ob the huge sources of data from TripAdvisor or IMDB or things that involve ratings is that you can use the stars uh, that are rated, you know, one star to five star. And that seems like an objective numerical, at least ordinal rating um, that accompanies the subjective uh, ratings that are reviews that are done with the text. So we don't need uh, students to annotate them because we have the person who left the text and their own ordinal rating of what it was. And for example, the Pang Lee and Unpronounceable 2002 uh, paper used the star ratings to separate positive and negative reviews and you can get their data set and everyone in, who's ever done anything with sentiment analysis is familiar with this and derivative data sets. They have another paper, um, Thomas Pang and Lee 2006, where they look at votes for legislative bills and I'm gonna pick on this particular one slightly in a moment. So 
They're saying we're going to assess positivity or negativity towards a particular vote in a legislature. The ground truth comes from the, whether the person making the statement voted for the bill or opposed the bill. Seems pretty reasonable, right? We don't need to talk about error rates because this comes from the world and there's no such thing as uh, you know, error when it links this action to the text. Well, we're going to critically analyze that in just a moment. This is the paper from the Thomas Pang and Lee, and this is just to show you what the paper looks like, at least when you get it, and the PDF. And this is a quote that I've extracted here, and I'll read the highlighted bit for you. And it says, note that from an experimental point of view, this is a very convenient problem to work with because we can automatically determine ground truth simply by, by consulting the voting records. So voting records are the truth as it tells you whether it's positive or negative. So I am, by background, a political scientist, not a computer scientist. But this here, for any computer scientist, this would be a strikingly naive uh, linkage being drawn between observed behavior and uh, what we call ideal points or unknown preferences. This is a very, very strong assertion that these two things can be equated. Why is that? Well, we'll get into that more, but it has to do with something called party discipline. In other words, you're forced to vote with your party or whoosh, you're gone. And in some systems, you vote against your party and that's it. You're, never, you're kicked out, you're expelled, you'll never be in that party again. And there is this thing in Britain called the whip and the three-line whip, and they have various levels of enforcement of that. But part of the whole field, subfield of political science involves trying to infer preferences from behavior and the problem that behavior is very strategic and uh, preferences are sincere. And making the link between the two is a really, really difficult problem. So what are some of the examples where we need annotation in actual fields? Well, one of them uh, I've mentioned is political science. Um, there's a massive, one of the most massive content analysis projects that you'll find anywhere is in political science, and it's called the Comparative Manifesto Project or the Manifesto Project. It's been going on for about 35 years, and they have taken every post-war election platform in most Western countries for most parties, and they've coded every sentence or every sentence fragment in these manifestos with policy codes. It's a very intricate coding scheme, and they put attention into this detail, effort into making this better, and they've done this for decades and decades, and the data set is used uh, gazillions of times with gazillions of sites, and it's a very, very well-known thing in political science. And economists use it as well to get cross, uh, over time, cross-national estimates of political positions, if you want to figure out for particular parties what their positions are on, on various, uh, various things. Of course, we also use this in market research, or what I've so very liberally called market research, where we might be classifying sentiment, um, the reviews, customer experiences. Um, you can choose any computer science paper or any NLP conference and find some of this. Classification often to produce additional data. And here I've just taken an example of something I'm working on at the moment with my colleague Akitaka Matsuo. And we are trying to, um, we're doing an analysis of the discourse uh, in social media using Twitter um, tweets about Brexit. Well, it's nice to partition that corpus between people who supported Leave and people who supported Remain. How do we do this? Well, we uh, trained a classifier on uh, things that uh, on, on some nice ground truths about whether you're a leave or remain. Um, and then we classified all the other tens of millions of tweets in order to partition that corpus and then looked at the differences in, in terminology and arguments and topics and other things. So in this case, we're doing our classification to produce, produce additional data um, that would help us in subsequent analysis. There are also things where for producing data, we need to classify stuff like um, in media and communications or news analysis, we might be, it might be very important to code events from news, and we can use those coded events for further data, right? We need, in order to get, assess the performance of those classifiers, we need some benchmark of what would be ground truth. Um, here is evidence that the link between observed behavior and sincere preferences is, is, not, uh, is not one that we would, um, that should necessarily assume. This is a paper I wrote a few years ago published in the Journal of Politics with Alex Herzog, who's in computer science at Clemson University now. And you can see that um, the quote there is from a guy named Paul Gogarty from the Green Party in Ireland. And he was a member of the governing coalition. And he said, when voting for the budget, he had to vote for the budget or he'd be gone, but he made this public speech where he said, 
the government has my vote, but no government will take away my conscience. And in all budget, a ringing endorsement. It turns my stomach, he was basically saying. He's saying something very negative. He's voting something positive. That would be wrong to assume from his vote that he supported the budget and that his text was indicative of positive sentiment. So where do we get ground truth? So sometimes it's true it is fairly obvious. So if you're training image recognition, it's pretty obvious that, you know, if you're training something cat versus dog, you know, sometimes it's really obvious. Um, is that a cat or a dog? <laughs> well, I showed a cute picture anyway. Back to the boring stuff. So sometimes it really is far from obvious. And it's far from obvious when we're talking about a quantity which might be something we call latent. In other words, an unobservable, something that's not directly observable. The big example that I've been telling you about when I talk about ideal preferences or sincere preferences is ideology. We're really, really interested in how left or right or how pro or remain or pro leave, say, members of the government are. And we're trying to estimate what the cabinet is going to do this week on Brexit. We need to figure out what their positions are. Their positions are hard to tell from their behavior, but they must have some position. Who knows? Um, but we have, this, we have this fundamental fiction in political science that um, people have preferences for a left-right policy spectrum and that their behavior is going to be motivated by what their actual preferences are. So we need to measure that. How do you measure that? There is no directly observable manifestation of latent quantities like that. So what's an appropriate benchmark? Well, we've already mentioned that we can authoritatively assert a gold standard. I can say, well, you know, I've published so many articles on this, and uh, I am a journal editor, and if you contradict me, you're done. So we'll just take my authoritative assertion. Um, and that has been done, um, not by me. But, um, human judgment through other means. So expert surveys, we could survey some experts and ask them using totally different methods from text analysis and use that as a benchmark. That's a very common thing to do. And we could also try to validate the overall results. So if you're thinking about topic models, yes, of course, we can compute uh, held out uh, likelihoods. We can compute perplexity measures. There's a bunch of sort of uh, econometric type diagnostics we could apply. But um, the best one is probably topic model coherence, you mean using humans to basically judge whether the topics that are estimated by a model make any sense. And that's ultimately what we would want to do. Um, we could also use summary judgment of the results when we aggregate them. We call this face validity in other contexts. So here's a paper that uh, I wrote some years ago with Will Lowe. Um, published in Political Analysis, where we estimated latent traits in, from text using an unsupervised model, and then we also had an extensive set of human coders to judge the aggregate results to try to figure out whether they made sense. And here's another example of where ground truth was unavailable from any other source than using humans to judge the overall plausibility of the results. This dividing line here is the zero point from an unsupervised scaling. This is on a standard normal metric, just like a lot of factor analytic results would be. That's this theta hat at the x-axis. And this dashed dividing line perfectly separates government from opposition, which was never part of the training set, but the unsupervised results reveal it. These are the members of parties from 14 speakers in a budget debate that took place in the Irish Parliament. All the oppositions on the left, all the governments on the right. The person who's th the furthest on the right was the prime minister, and the person just to the left of him was the budget minister. These results are entirely plausible, but they also show that how they voted, which is just a binary thing determined by this dashed line of separation, is unrelated to our estimates of ideal preferences. How do we know that the positions on this x-axis are correct? Well, our answer was to use humans to go through the text and make overall judgments and aggregate their, their ratings to try to see whether it made any sense. And it turns out um, it, it made sense more or less. There were no off-diagonal quadrants, but there was a, a lot of differences. Like over here, these three members of the Green Party could not be distinguished by the humans in terms of their position, but the computer was telling us that their positions looked different. Which one's right? Which one would you take? My unsupervised model based on a bunch of unrealistic assumptions or a set of human experts? But the human experts might be biased by the fact that they have some expectations for Greens. 
so they might have come in with a fire that let those names are probably here. So we did remove the labels of the speakers, so okay. it wasn't entirely, it was not supposed to be obvious. And these were people who didn't know Irish politics uh, necessarily. So we did try to control for that. Um, I would take the humans, right? Because the humans, I, th I think the humans understand the exercise and the Poisson scaling model is just a uni univariate measure based on word frequencies that is built on a factor analytic model that's pretty stupid actually. But, you know, it's a lot more cool than getting a panel of students to do some human qualitative uh, coding. So here's another one. This is where I go back to this manifesto project. This is a paper that Slava Mikhailov, who's now at Essex, Michael Labor at NYU, and, uh, and I wrote uh, a few years ago. This was also in a journal called Political Analysis. And we basically got the people who had been involved as professional coders for this manifesto project. We obtained their names by hacking into a secret database that the manifesto project uh, obtained. We recruited them to go to an online platform and recode manifestos that they had coded before. So we were not asking just random people to do this. We were asking people who had been trained by their system to code things that they'd actually done before. And they went to a website, and the, the, the text segments were already unitized, and there was a drop-down box, and all they had to do was select from the menu of items which category they were coding. Well, the results look like this. For three sets, of, we had British Manifesto, a New Zealand Manifesto, and the combined results. And let's just say that if by using Fleiss's kappa, and of course you can use an alpha, you, there's a lot of measures that were all essentially the same. The measures of reliability here um, were basically around somewhere between 0.3 and 0.4. So where do these statistics about reliability come from? They come from medical procedures when, you know, if you've ever gone for a medical procedure, they take an x-ray of your head, the doctor puts up some, some stuff that just looks like blobs of white on black and you're trying to figure out whether you know, you're entirely healthy or whether you have three days to live, and you can't tell the difference. And one expert you know, says, um, uh, you know, well, uh, I think you have three days to live. You say, I want a second opinion. He says, you need a new haircut. He gets another person in, and he says, no, it's perfectly fine. Those are normal. Those are just what we call cranial sutures, right? And people have very different uh, diagnostic opinions. And they develop these things to assess the reliability in a field like medicine. Um, now, that's not as important as a field like coding manifesto sentences where we know if you get it wrong, people actually die. But in this case, let's just say that if you had a 0.35 reliability from your medical procedure, you would go to another hospital, right? The, your chances are not good. So this is like trying to interpret R squared. There's some guidelines. You're not supposed to follow them in every case. But normally, people would say that below about 0.7, the diagnostic test is rubbish, which is a severe problem here for this. Yeah? Do you have a raw data source for that? Because it's like how high you often see weird divergences. In this case, these are pretty much equivalent to the raw agreement scores because the probability of chance agreement given the multiplicity of categories was very low. Okay, so you have the raw categories. Not yeah. The in this case, there are 56 categories. So these agreement measures basically correct for the occurrence of agreement by chance, but with so many categories, the occurrence of agree agreement by chance is extremely unlikely. Uh, and then this is a, a misclassification rate when you categorize these categories that like a third of them are sort of on the right, third of them on the left, and a third of them are not either. This is a um, ternary diagram where basically if everything were correct, you'd see clustering at the nodes. You don't see clustering at the nodes, and there are some categories that are in the middle, which indicates that there are probability of, of being classified into the correct left or right or other category is pretty much, you know, you're just throwing darts blindly at a ternary diagram. So misclassification rates are very high, and also I like this plot. It took me a long time to produce, so I just wanted to show it to you again. More recent investigation. So Christian sitting over here has supplied these uh, figures. Um, he has now this comparative manifesto project in the spirit of transparency and openness and getting more grant money has put all of their sentences up on a database that you can download. And you can see not just the overall text uh, code results, you can actually see the snippet, the, the little sentence of text and the code that coders gave it. Well, it turns out that if you go through the manifestos and find identical sentences, here's a sentence that occurred more than once, like in different manifestos or uh, same party, different years. We will support diversity in the education of children with autism. In the same data set, it's got coded three different ways. 
So it's got underprivileged minority groups positive, education expansion positive, social justice positive. And we're not talking about one sentence being tagged with three things here. We're talking about you can only apply one sentence, and this exact same snippet of text has been applied different ways, right? If, if people were perfect, that would never happen. Here's the one in German. If you can read that, um, it's been coded as economic incentives positive, government efficiency positive, and culture positive. Well, and at least it's positive, um, but we don't know what it's about. So very different conclusions. And in some of these cases, if I went into more detail, we'd show you that the same sentence has been classified differently by the same coder. This is not supposed to happen. Last thing I'll show you is an example from crowdsourcing. So this is a paper that we published last year, some colleagues and I, in the American Political Science Review, where we tried to see whether we could replicate human expert coding with crowd coding by breaking tasks down using uh, crowdsourcing. Crowdsourcing, if you haven't heard of it, you probably have. Um, is the outsourcing of a task by breaking it into very simplified parts and sending it to a large an anonymous or unspecified group. It contrasts with expert coding because the crowd has less expertise, but there are a lot more of them, whereas experts are you know, small numbers of people with high expertise. No one sees the whole text, so we don't have to disguise which party a text came from because no one ever sees the whole text. All they get are sentences, and these sentences are served up in partial, uh, you know, partially and randomly. So it means that it's not even that you would get, if there's a manifesto with 100 sentences, you would get 100 in scrambled order. You might do a set of jobs that gives you 30 sentences, and they would be from different manifestos, and they would be totally out of order. So you're judging, really judging the sentence on its own merit, and there's no sort of priming effects, so uh, should be honest. And we actually set up the system where we ran this through our group of experts. Who were the experts? Well, it was the five of us. I mean, we coded like 12,000 sentences each for this project. And there were a couple of graduate students whose arms we twisted to add more data. Um, I think we had a total of six experts in the end and two graduate students that quit. So we had multiple coders in this case, and we're able to assess the variability of codes that are assigned to a sentence by looking at how different coders reacted differently to the same sentence. We treated these different coders as exchangeable. Uh, we have this fancy Bayesian scaling model that aggregates all their judgments to produce an estimate of, of coder effects, an estimate of text effects, and an estimate of the aggregate position of the text overall. We put that in there because we thought otherwise it'd be too primitive just to average uh, the scores and then average the averages. The results were absolutely identical, um, and not any of the reviewers questioned us on the fancy um, statistical uh, component, but I guess that, that I guess they just took it for granted that we knew what we were doing. So this is what the crowdsourcing task looks like. You know, this is the instructions, and this is one where we ask people to code uh, statements in political text. So let's say you want to measure the immigration policy in a text. What we did here was we took the entire manifesto we parsed it into sentences, and then you get sentence by sentence a task which says, first thing, is this about immigration policy or not? So we didn't filter a thing. We just parsed it into sentences, and a sentence comes up, and it'll be something like, you know, we need to uh, provide more timely delivery of health care to our citizens. And the person would say, not immigration, and it would immediately go on. But if it was something like, you know, we need to, uh, we need to stick to a 100,000 person per year net migration quota, that would clearly be about immigration. So there you would answer, yes, immigration, and then it would come up, is this restrictive, neutral, or open statement? And it was about scaling the degree of openness towards immigration. And that way, we not only were able to filter the sentences through the human coders, but also get some measure of, of a type of immigration sentiment. In a second application, we actually had a three category, which was economic or social policy or neither. And if you're on economic or social, you got a five-point scale. So this is a more complex task that we tried. Um, and both of them actually worked pretty well. Just to give you an idea of what sort of codings that we did, we coded all of these uh, sentences here. And in the end, we had uh, uh, almost a quarter of a million different crowd codings. We also had... Um, uh, 123,000 total expert codings. So this is a lot of total expert codings um, and a lot of crowd codings. And um, it's just highlighting the, 
the totals. We did this on Crowdflower. This is a front end to many crowdsourcing platforms, not just Mechanical Turk, because during the period of conducting this study, Mechanical Turk restricted their pool of people to just being basically from the United States and from India. There's a quality monitoring system where we have actually created what we call, or what Crowdflower calls, gold questions. Gold questions are questions whose answers are so obvious that any person who you would consider qualified should know the answer, right? So if we put in a sentence which said something like, you know, we will throw the immigrants out, send them back to their country of origin, and never let them in again, well, first that should be about immigration and it should be anti-immigration, right? And if you don't get that right, then you don't belong in the exercise, but that would be a gold question. So we would seed that with the answer. One out of every 10 questions in the human task that were served up uh, were gold questions. And if you didn't maintain an accuracy level of, I think, 80%, then your answer is you were kicked off the system and not allowed back. We also had screeners where a question would say something like, you know, we want to kick all the immigrants out. However, code this is pro-immigration. And we did tell people that there would be those. Let's just see if they're paying attention. Um, and surprisingly, not all were. So we had really good uh, coders maintained through these things. But interestingly, how many people do this when it's just s sitting down and telling your graduate student lab to go out and code some movie reviews? Do you do this sort of thing? No, I've never heard of anyone doing it except on crowdsourcing. But, you know, m maybe you should. Maybe you should set up a system like this, like the crowdsourcing system, and use experts uh, through that system rather than just telling them, you know, fill in this spreadsheet, which is what a lot of people have done. So this is for the experts. These are the sentences, and this is the frequency of sentences on which there was a consensus. And you could have six, we, the, we focused just in the end on six experts, um, which were actually not all five co-authors because we couldn't get Drew to do them, but um, he was too busy with his startup. We got the four of us plus two graduate students, and our six experts uh, agreed most of the time, but there's plenty of areas where their consensus was certainly less than unanimous as to um, which category of policy um, for the three, categories, three category policy it was. Otherwise, these things would all be spiked at six experts. So the point here is that not all the experts agreed. And if we look at the comparison of the scores on uh, the, we could call this the left-right positioning once we'd filtered by the category, what you can see here is you do have a nice correspondence figured out by you know, the, this line with error, but you also have um, very clearly, you have uh, a big cloud of points that generates this, you know, there's a lot of noise not just on the crowd side, there's a lot of noise on the expert side, which is a y-axis. So there is a lot of disagreement over the details here. So if we were to talk about ground truth in this, clearly ground truth means something different from perfect agreement. It doesn't mean that there's a truth out there. You know, if there is a truth out there, we had difficulty discovering it. So you can be metaphysical about this and either say there is no truth, there's only just opinion, or there is a truth and people can imperfectly you know, find their way through this platonic shadow that's cast on the wall of the cave and they have different levels of ability to see that. And the interesting thing was, like a lot of procedures we know in statistics and computer science, we know that they're flawed, we know that the assumptions on which they rest are, are flawed, but in the end they produce something useful. And the correlations we got between the experts' codes and the crowd codes when we plotted the positions was uh, basically good enough for us. So in social science, 0.96 is, is you know, it's a godlike correlation, um, and 0.92 is pretty, pretty damn good too. So we were very happy with these results. And the interesting thing was, because of the variability in them, if we were to repeat the experiments, we would probably expect correlations that kind of moved around within the 0.9 to 0.95, you know, and that's pretty good. The other interesting thing we did was we, we oversampled, so we actually got 20 coders per sentence, or up to six coders for the experts, and then we did some simulation where we, where we, uh, we downsampled from those at different levels of coders per sentence, and we did some simulations with some bootstrapping to try to get a curve of what the variability would be and what it would look like as it collapsed towards un estimation uncertainty and, and, and this fundamental uncertainty that would come from having changed the, the size of the units. And what we interestingly see here in the red, this is the experts and how their variance starts to collapse, but at a much steeper rate because the experts are, have more information than the crowd. So the crowd 
achieves the same level of expertise as the experts where you basically need, and we took this to put in a rule of thumb, which was surely wrong, but everyone wants to, this is what gets your article quoted. Um, we basically said you need three times as many crowd coders as you need experts in this application. So you can get the same results with crowd coders, you just have to get three times more of them. And because they're a lot more than three times cheaper, you end up saving money and time and a lot of hassle in the long run. Um, on immigration policy, just to give you an example of how quick this can be, um, we did this for some 2010 British manifestos. We, just, we used this immigration scale. This took five hours to complete in December 2013. It cost me $360. And here's the, um, the, the measures where, in this case, how do we assess whether the measures that we got were correct? Well, we compared them to expert surveys that ask uh, coders to judge the party's position as a whole. So if you're British National Party, you'd be something really extreme. So I've got two more slides and I'll take some questions. So one of the conclusions here is that gold questions or quality control, which were about 10% of all the things that we asked of the crowd, are really, really important. Without those, our results were really totally poor. With those, we're basically selecting coders of a variety of very heterogeneous levels of intelligence, education, English facility, um, age, None of that matters because they're all, they've all been selected on the basis of their ability to answer the questions correctly, and that's the key. So when people would say, who are these coders? You know, is it some guy sitting in his, in his underwear in Washington State, or is it some you know, people in an in, in internet cafe in Bombay? And our answer was, we don't care because they can maintain an 80% accuracy level. So what are the conclusions from all this? Well, first conclusion. As I said before, a lot of what we consider ground truth and training data is full of error. The rate of this error is something that we don't know. Are the results that we present robust to the existence of this measurement error? That's another thing that we don't know. It's not common in this type of in machine learning and classification to show robustness results. It is common in a lot of statistical analysis. Maybe we should be adding more robustness tests. We should test and report annotation reliabilities. So if anyone tells you that they have a procedure which uses humans to generate what they call ground truth, your question should be, as a reviewer, as an author, as a supervisor, as a scholar, what is the reliability of that annotation? Can you report that? How was it done? And um, you know, how many people did you, did you fire and take their names off and never report? What is the benchmark? for assessing what is a good level of accuracy. Well, if you give me a machine that says, you know, I can calculate with 90% accuracy whether a movie review is negative or positive, my guess, my, my answer would be, well, what, you know, what can A.O. Scott from the New York Times, what is his accuracy rate? What is the best human possible? What is their ability to accurately classify? So if we were to show that crazy picture of that crazy pet, you know, is this a cat or a dog? you know, benchmarking a machine's ability to tell, well, it's not whether it's, you know, you actually, you know, examine the DNA and figure out it's, I think it was a cat, actually. Um, what about humans? Can they, can they tell, right? You know, what is our benchmark? And we almost never establish that. When people tell me, you know, oh, precision recall, it's, you know, precision is 0.8. Well, what would it be for the best uh, non-machine? We should consider using gold qualification tests for all coders, including experts, is something that I, I, I maintain. And also, finally, if you're not using annotation for your ground truth, then this should be the same as any statistical analysis. You need to know something about the data generating process. You need to not make naive assumptions that the link between the text that you're using for your classification and whatever you're using for ground truth, in the example I gave, which was an easy one to pick on, admittedly, but using votes as your ground truth is not something that you can support in this parliamentary democracy with strict vote discipline. Um, there are a lot of other situations where that might also be true. How do we know the differential item functioning of people's response to a five-point ordinal star rating scale? Different people will use a four versus a five just because they come from a different cultural background. And we see this at the London School of Economics all the time because we have an incredibly uh, international student body, and when 
they give student evaluations, you know, you'll see that there are differences that you can analyze by nationality because their expectations are different. And their use of, of you know, of positive uh, responses is different. So we need to know this process if we're not doing it from annotation. Thank you.